Imagine you're going about your business, just living your life, when all of a sudden the world ripples, and in a blink, you're somewhere else. Maybe you've somehow moved thousands of miles to the other side of the country. Maybe you even find yourself in a strange land where no one speaks your language. Or maybe you've been transported, not through space, but through time, either forward or backward. We're going to examine real cases where this or something similar seems to have happened. We'll meet real people who suffered this tragic fate. Perhaps most intriguing, some of these strange events might have actually changed human history. Now, you probably remember hearing about Danny Philadapis, a Toronto fire captain on a ski trip with friends in 2018 in Lake Placid, New York. While out on the trails, he realized he had forgotten his phone in the car. So he told his buddies he'd be right back and left them to retrieve it. Next thing he knew, he was 3,000 miles away in California. Huh. We'll come back to the fire captain later. While there are possible explanations for some of these stories, no single one can apply sensibly to all of them, as you'll see. For example, a possible explanation for certain cases could be amnesia. At the heart of these mysteries is someone who has suffered physical or psychological trauma in a way that shuts down part of their memory system. So they don't just disappear into thin air and reappear somewhere else. Instead, they travel unnoticed and have no memory of their journey. But if you're hoping that explanation will work on all of these mysteries, you'll be disappointed. If you can take comfort in easy answers, some of these stories will probably disturb you to the core. We'll even take a brief look at more exotic theories, such as natural time warps or dimensional doorways. You might be inclined to dismiss these things, but even as we speak, many of the top physicists in the world are researching the possibility these phenomena are very real. Contrasting the Lake Placid case is the far, far more disturbing one of Maggie Gill, her story also begins in a mountain when she was found wandering Mount Washington in New Hampshire in a state of hypothermia. It's 1943, smack in the middle of the Second World War. Maggie Gill is 22 years old, or perhaps not. You see, from Maggie's point of view, it's 1974 in Portland, Oregon, and she's 53 years old. She's happily married, has three children, and enjoys long hikes along the coast with her faithful German shepherd, Roger. She's out with Roger on a warm summer day, when suddenly she becomes aware she's now impossibly on a snowy mountain and Roger is nowhere to be seen. His barking can be heard in the distance, but as she moves to find him, it fades away until gone. Freezing and confused, she wanders, eventually finding a trail and heading down. But by the time the rangers come upon her, she's close to collapse and suffering hypothermia. While recovering in a hospital nearby, she's shocked to learn the year is not 1974. According to everyone in the hospital, it's 1943. The nation is tense because most of the young men are off fighting against either Japanese or Germans, and the war hangs in the balance. And she's not in Portland, Oregon, but somehow is on the other side of the coast in New Hampshire. From the perspective of her rescuers, a confused young woman was found wandering Mount Washington in clothing and footwear unlike anything they'd ever seen. After contacting authorities in Portland, they learned Maggie had been reported missing the day before. This was the time before jet airplanes, and before the creation of the highway system. So cross-country travel was slow and difficult. No one could understand how she might get to New Hampshire so fast. According to hospital documents, Maggie's memory of recent months and years were foggy, as though for her, these things happened a very long time ago. Doctors understood very little about the brain at the time, but they hoped to, that rest and recovery would lead to a return of enough memory that they could piece together how she had gone from Oregon to New Hampshire. Islands of memory did trickle back, but what came were descriptions of events that happened in years closer to 1974. Most of these memories involved her personal life, and the staff at the hospital assumed these to be delusion. When she began recounting historical events from the history of the 1960s and 70s, these two were considered fantasy at first. She talked about a president being assassinated and another resigning in disgrace. She mentioned unheard of football championships called Super Bowls, and she claimed that men were sent to the moon. None of this struck a chord with anyone until she mentioned atomic bombs. The Manhattan Project, established to develop the world's first nuclear weapons, was the most closely guarded secret in U.S. history. No one outside of those involved with the project knew about it. When word reached the military that Maggie had mentioned atomic bombs, the army took her into custody. Unfortunately for Maggie, not only did they have many questions for her, 
but they could not afford to let her walk around talking about their biggest secret weapon while the U.S. was in the middle of an epic struggle against the Axis powers. We'll come back to the consequential story of Maggie after exploring some more cases which might shed some insight. In 1926, Agatha Christie, already famous mystery novelist and national treasure in England, became the center of a tale as mysterious as any of the ones she created. One evening, Christie kissed her seven-year-old daughter, Rosalind, goodnight, went out to her expensive car and drove off into the night. She didn't reappear until 11 days later. Her disappearance caused a massive manhunt involving a thousand police, hundreds of civilians, and even airplanes. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, hired a medium and attempted to invoke paranormal powers to find her. It didn't work. Police did manage to locate her in an abandoned car on a steep slope miles away. However, there was no sign of Agatha, no evidence of an accident, no indication she had been hurt. Near where the car had been discovered was a pond called Silent Pool, which had a supernatural reputation. Fed by a natural spring, the mild waters create an oasis of lush woods unique to the region. As far back as Arthurian times, it had long been considered a kind of sacred place. Other girls had disappeared there before, and the ghost of one was said to haunt the waters under the moonlight. Investigators feared Christy had drowned in the lake. 11 days after her disappearance, Agatha was finally found at a hotel in the distant town of Harrogate. You were hoping I'd say Hogwarts, weren't you? Anyway, the mystery writer was safe and sound, or seemingly sound, for she didn't remember anything about the last 11 days. At the hotel, she'd been living under a different name. She'd seen the headlines about the search for her, but had not recognized herself in the photos. But you're here for more tantalizing cases than that, aren't you? We won't disappoint. Consider the living unknown soldiers. During World War I, both sides mercilessly shelled each other for four years. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers had to lie in the trenches riding out these horrible bombardments, the explosions assaulting their ears and the shockwaves rattling their brains within their skulls. They could hear the whistling overhead. They never knew if one of those shells might have their number on it. The psychological and physical trauma came to be called shell shock. The damage could be long lasting or even permanent and often involved severe amnesia. At the end of the war, Germany returned 65 severely traumatized soldiers to the Allies, some of whom didn't remember who they were and couldn't be identified. One of these soldiers, Octavi Magnoin, remained anonymous until 1930, when his picture from an asylum had been shared with newspapers. But a much stranger case involved a man who called himself William Strafford. The Englishman had awoken as a prisoner inside a German camp in 1916, the midpoint of the war. His physical health quickly recovered and mentally seemed fine as well, except he suffered from a severe tantalizing case of amnesia. According to German medical records, he couldn't remember much of anything beyond his name. He couldn't say where in England he came from, who his family were, or even what year he'd been born. Pretty much everything was a blank and efforts by the German authorities after the war to contact his family in England were unsuccessful. However, he did remember the location of the battle where he had been injured. This puzzled the Germans then, but it is even more intriguing to us now with the hindsight of history, for he claimed to have been fighting in a place in France the Germans never reached during the First World War, a place that would later be made famous in the Second World War, Dunkirk. Two other fascinating cases have a kind of reverse synchronicity. Ansel Bourne, a preacher from Rhode Island, forgot his identity and spent two months opening a toy store in Pennsylvania while Damon Wills, a wealthy owner of a toy factory in Massachusetts, disappeared in a kind of trance and ended up in New Mexico building a church and trying to establish an apocalyptic congregation in the middle of the desert. This story will give you chills. In 1887, Ansel Bourne, a 61-year-old preacher outside Providence, Rhode Island, suddenly found himself the owner of a toy store in Norristown, Pennsylvania. After spending a couple of months opening the store, he woke up one day unsure why he was buying toys and having no memory of his identity. He knocked on the door of the landlord that opened the storefront property and asked, who am I? The story got picked up by the Philadelphia Inquirer and an appeal went out to the public to help solve the riddle of who he was. It turned out that Bourne had previously been through another strange experience many years earlier. In 1851, a kind of road to Damascus conversion where he had been struck temporarily deaf and blind. This was what led him to become a preacher in the first place but also resulted in the publication of a pamphlet describing his wondrous conversion. That pamphlet got reprinted many times, 
making Bourne somewhat famous. And in Philadelphia, someone finally recognized him as a preacher. Town authorities contacted Bourne's family in Rhode Island and his nephew hurried down to bring him home. We can speculate that his initial conversion experience was the result of a fall, perhaps from a horse or a carriage, but that the second experience resulted from a brain that had never fully healed. Of course, the two experiences were separated by 36 years. Harder to explain away is the really disturbing case of Damon Wills. In 1911, the wealthy toy manufacturer from Lawrence, Massachusetts, found himself in a trance-like state con constructing a church in the middle of the desert in New Mexico. Claiming to be a preacher in the old style, he built a rickety structure with the help of a handful of local laborers. He had no congregation, as far as anyone could tell, and didn't even seem to know the Bible all that well. But he insisted his work was crucial in heading off God's wrath, a divine anger not seen, he promised, since the time of Noah. Well, we know this only because a local reporter, curious about the strange project, went to interview him. According to the account by Fields Reese, Will seemed like a man sleepwalking, like his glassy, faraway stare gazing on sights he could only see. The newspaper article achieved what Willis could not by himself. It brought him a congregation, not necessarily of believers, but at the very least curiosity seekers. As the days grew closer when the church would be completed, folks wondered just what kind of sermon this strange preacher would spin. But eventually the publicity from the local newspaper also reached back, reached back east to Massachusetts and relatives of Wills who had been desperately searching for him, caught wind of it. They went to New Mexico to fetch him, and Damon Wills seemed to pop out of his trance at the sight of them. Gone before the first sermon was even delivered were the plans to preach about God's coming wrath. The church was abandoned. However, 34 years later, the U.S. Army built a 100-foot-tall steel tower just yards away from the rotting and falling wreckage of the structure. Intriguing, right? Whatever remains of the church built by Damon Wills is now encased in a green glass-like solid called Trinitite. It can be visited twice a year in April and October when tours are allowed into the, onto the missile range of White Sands, the location of the first atomic bomb. There's also the disturbing case of Michael Boatwright. Imagine you woke up in a hospital with no recollection of who you are other than a name, and that name doesn't match the one on your ID. What's worse, you don't speak a single word of the local language. Boatwright found himself at the Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, but he could not communicate with staff because he only spoke one language, Swedish. He believed his name to be Johan Eck, using a different name than the, than the ID found on him, and apparently his real name. Police traced things back to his hotel room, which he'd arrived at the day before. Inside the hotel room were five tennis rackets and no money. The hospital allowed him to stay in the room there for months, hoping his memory would return, but it never did. It turned out the man was a veteran of the US Navy, but there's no indication he ever spoke Swedish before waking up in the hospital and no history of him ever coaching tennis. Yet an interesting solution was found. Palm Springs paid to fly him to Sweden where he could finally communicate with the people who spoke his language. And he took on a job as a tennis instructor. Huh. Things that make us go, hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't really after you. In the early 1800s, a strange limping boy was found wandering through the German streets holding an envelope addressed to a cavalry captain in Nuremberg. The boy only knew a few words, though he did know his name, Caspar Hauser. Sympathetic townspeople tried to feed the hungry boy his favorite meal, sausage and beer, but he acted repulsed as a never having seen such things before. Eventually, they, con they convinced him to eat bread and water. The locals taught him some German, hoping to find answers, and he eventually communicated he had grown up in a darkened cell too small for him to stand up, causing his limp. But he had an obsession for horses and wanted to be a rider, like his father, he said, even though he revealed nothing about who his father was. Eventually, the royal courts locked him up in a tower while they investigated the matter. The letters he'd been carrying backed his claims, and one of them contained a strange warning that if he couldn't become a rider, he may have to be killed. For a while, the story seemed to be headed towards a happy ending. He, he had become a famous and beloved character around the royal court, but the strange letter may have foretold the mysterious danger he faced, for there were multiple attempts to assassinate him. Unfortunately, in 1828, when he was only 21 years old, an intruder succeeded in stabbing him to death and escaping without being caught. <laughs> 
A shoemaker in 19th century England named James Warson had legendary running speed and a penchant for wagering on himself. One day, his friends bet he couldn't run for 16 miles within a certain time. He accepted the bet, and they selected a long country road. His friends followed his trek on a horse and carriage, and Warson seemed to be on a path to succeed when he suddenly let out a piercing scream. His friends caught a quick glimpse of the sheer terror in Warson's face before he vanished into thin air. His friends scanned the area and then enlisted the help of the police. Not a trace was ever found. An older X-File, well-documented at the time, remains baffling. This is the famous story of the Green Children of Woolpit, a town in medieval England. In 1134, villagers noticed two children emerging from deep trenches dug to trap wolves. The peasants grabbed the kids and pulled them to safety. They immediately noticed how very odd these children were. A boy and a girl, both were dangerously underweight, had almond-shaped non-human eyes, wore weird clothes, and had bright green skin. The crying children were sick and hungry, but refused to eat anything the villagers offered. What's more, they didn't speak any English, and the language they did speak could not be identified. The boy died within a matter of days. However, the girl slowly started eating the beans offered her, and she recovered. What's more, her green hue faded until she looked almost like a normal girl. She also eventually learned English, and her tale only added to the mystery. According to her, she and her brother came from an underground world called St. Martin's Land, and the people there all had green skin. She said two of them had wandered into a cave drawn by a mysterious bell and emerged into the wolf's pit of the world above, where they were pulled up by the locals. It was the first time she had ever seen the sun. A generous lord raised the girl, and she went on to marry. It's not known if they had any offspring or descendants named Lou Ferrigno. Could be. It's not unreasonable to get the idea from some of these cases that under certain rare natural conditions, a portal to another time or dimension might temporarily open up. Consider the 1880 disappearance of David Lang in Gallatin, Tennessee, witnessed by multiple people. Lang's two children, eight and 11, were playing in the yard while his brother-in-law and his friend, a local judge named Peck, were approaching in a buggy to visit. Seeing the arrival of visitors, Lang and his wife came out of their house to meet them. David started walking across the pasture towards the coming buggy while Peck and his brother-in-law watched him come from within it. Suddenly, Mrs. Lang began screaming. Something was wrong. And as Judge Peck and his brother-in-law watched David walking towards them, they saw him fade, then completely disappear into thin air. He was never seen again. Everyone hurried to the spot where he'd vanished. There was no fences or trees, just dried out grass and a flat field, nowhere to hide. They examined the ground for cracks and found none. A distraught Miss Lang had to be helped into the home. The town bell rang and soon neighbors turned up to help search. Experts were brought in and there seemed to be no natural explanation. A geologist determined there was no fracture in the underlying bedrock. And of course, the witnesses describing seeing David fade away. The event proved to be disastrous for the family. Obviously, a father and husband had been lost, which is tragic enough, but the spook servants quit and fled, making it all but impossible to operate the farm. But it gets weirder. The precise spot where David had disappeared remained well off. Grass grew unusually high in this 20 foot circle because livestock wouldn't touch it. And even insects stayed out of it. Many curiosity speakers came to visit this haunted patch of land and most of them developed a sickening feeling some described an ominous presence, others just considered it an unnatural place and were sorry they visited. A year later, the two children missing their dad stood outside the circle and called into it, Father, are you there? To their shock came a very faint cry for help from within the circle of tall grass. They ran to get their mother, and when she emerged from the house, she heard it too. This went on for several days, but the cries for help were growing more distant and then could no longer be heard. If disappearing individuals are intriguing, how about disappearing a disappearing battalion? And this event was documented by the British Army and soldiers who witnessed it. It's 1915, and the British are attempting an invasion of Turkey, which had recently joined up with Germany in what we now call World War I. Three Allied soldiers were watching a battalion of Royal Norfolk Regiment make its way up a hill that overlooks the battlefield. The soldiers observe a strange cloud slowly, to slowly descending towards the top of the hill as the battalion approaches. The men of the battalion then disappear into this cloud, which slowly ascends into the sky. After the war, 
The British government included the battalion on its list of prisoner exchange requests with Turkey, but the Turkish government insisted it had never had anyone from this particular group of men. The battalion had vanished from history. In 1942, police in the coastal town of Salisbury, Massachusetts captured, captured a small crew of men landing in a rowboat well after midnight. The shores along America's coast at that time were stalked by Nazi U-boats on the hunt for merchant ships. Authorities in coastal towns were on high alert for saboteurs and spies, which might come ashore. And sure enough, the men in the boat spoke German. Only one man in the crew understood a little English. And this man, Christoph Marcus, told a bewildering tale. This admitted they were German spies whose U-boat was stationed off the shore, but had never heard of Nazi Germany. They claimed, in fact, to be fighting for Kaiser Wilhelm Germany and they believed it was 1918. Taken to a cell in the local police station, the Germans were shown magazine photos of Nazi Germany. The stunned U-boatmen seemed disbelieving. Told that Germany occupied France, they were pleased, but Marcus started clamming up, suspicious that some game he couldn't understand was being played. The Germans would not accept that the year was 1942. MPs arrived from the US Army later that morning and whisked the prisoners off. Other than the account from Sal the Salisbury Police Department, no other documentation remains. The military claims to have no knowledge of the incident or of the captured Germans. It would seem the U.S. Army also has the power to make men disappear. Science fiction scenarios have long exploited the weird nature of black holes to create plot devices for their stories. The exotic nature of these entities, where the ordinary laws of physics are suspended, tempts us into seeing them as portals to another time or a parallel dimension. But it's not only sci-fi writers that are intrigued. It turns out that a few years ago, NASA itself launched a huge effort to find portals right near our planet using unmanned spacecraft. And mainstream scientists are exploring ways to use wormholes to travel to otherwise impossible destinations. The existence of other dimensions is no longer the domain of fiction, but rather of mainstream physics. The weird aspects of quantum theory suggest we live in a multiverse, which many different places of existence something now reluctantly accepted by most theoretical physicists. And some of those worlds, the ones we are more likely to connect to, are very similar to our own and could be inhabited. Cosmologist Lisa Randall recently told Smithsonian Magazine that there might be leakage between the universes. So she's searching for those doorways, not just to prove their existence, but we so we may be able to travel through them. Says Natural Science Foundation physicist Gaurav Khanna, that fantasy may be closer to reality than previously imagined. The key, black holes. But these massive things, these are massive things, right? Found at the centers of galaxy many light years away. Well, the latest theory suggests that trillions of tiny black holes were created at the birth of our universe and still exist, moving through space largely oblivious to matter because of their size. In fact, the solar system itself is likely filled with them which means sometimes they pass right through the planet, generally undetected. Would they have any impact? According to PBS's program, Nova, you would need to get within 12 feet to feel its effects, which sounds about the same size as the weird patch of land that David Lang disappeared into. NASA has launched a program to actually look for these doors into the unknown. Physicist Jack Scrutter tells us these portals are created in areas where the magnetic fields of the Earth and the sun collide. These intersections are called X points. According to observations by NASA's Themis spacecraft, these portals open and close dozens of times a day. Most of them are tiny and short lived, but others are vast and can remain open for a sustained time. What happens inside one of these portals is at present hard to predict, but distortions of time are a distinct possibility as are ruptures in ordinary space. Estimates that portals pass through planets once or twice a day, considering the size of the planet, that makes it very unlikely you or anyone would encounter one. But because they are virtually impossible to detect, if one of these things happened to be drifting through your location, you wouldn't be aware of it until you were right upon it. And then it would be too late. We've left you hanging on two of our stories, Toronto fire captain, Danny Philodopoulos and first time traveler, Maggie Gill. Sorry, we're tricky like that. If you recall, Philodopoulos went for his cell phone in the car on a ski trip in Lake Placid and ended up in California, 3,000 miles away, struggling to remember his name and having no memory of how he got there. A massive search had been organized in Lake Placid and his wife was there, along with the wives of the other guys in the trip, everyone desperate to find Danny. When the cell phone of Mrs. Philodopoulos rang, she saw a California number that wasn't in her contacts, 
She handed the phone to a friend to answer. To the friend's amazement on the other end of the line was Danny. He never did get his cell phone. So when he found himself dazed and confused in California, he bought another one. He had no injuries, just a fuzzy memory. The only thing that eventually came to him was hitching a ride across the country in an 18-wheeler. The truck driver has never been identified. If this is indeed how Danny traveled across the country in near record time, there is no corroborating evidence. Perhaps he suffered an injury on the slopes and in a state of confusion took the long ride. Or perhaps the hitchhiking explanation was a detail he concocted to account for something he couldn't explain. Well, finally, let's return to the much more disturbing tale of Maggie Gill. When we last saw her, she had been taken into custody by the military during the height of World War II, so she wouldn't run around talking about their atomic bombs, which were top secret. It's understandable that the military Terry, could not risk having her spread rumors about their secret weapon. But then why wasn't she released at the end of the war? She hadn't committed no crimes, as it happened. She did not gain her freedom until 1951, six years after the war and eight years after being imprisoned. We can probably assume she had something they wanted, information about the future. Whether she just had a great imagination or in fact had been transported from 1974 to 1943, Obviously, someone in the military believed her story, and they no doubt wanted to know much more. When they freed her at last in 1951, she was not yet 30, but the experience had all but broken her. She said no more about her memories of the future and nothing about her experience as a prisoner. Returning to Portland, she lived near her family, this time never marrying, never having children. But as 1974 approached, or from her perspective, again approached, she began to panic. Maggie was terrified she might be somehow transported back to 1943 again. Now, you might think the prospect of returning to a youthful body would be appealing, but to her it was horrific. She believed she might once again end up in a military prison, so she took her own life. There's a final intriguing twist. In her last days, she started talking about a nuclear war that the U.S. had fought in Korea and in China in 1950. The first 1950, that is. And during this brief war with the communist powers, a Soviet retaliatory strike of nuclear bomb had hit the West Coast. An American city was destroyed, Portland, Oregon. <laughs>